So, hello Nier, what is this technology? Let's talk about this. So Nier is cheaper, faster, and easier to use uh, for development and for production. Um, contracts, we write them in AssemblyScript or Rust. They compile to WASM, WebAssembly. There are a million JavaScript and TypeScript developers out there, maybe including some of you that can learn AssemblyScript in a matter of hours or days. And um, the uh, Rust tool chain is more mature. So for high value contracts, for very complex contracts, we would choose Rust, but uh, we can always have a mix of some assembly script and some Rust contracts uh, as part of the same decentralized application. So of course they would be different contracts, but these contracts can communicate using cross contract calls. Um, and then Near has this unique account system that makes it easy to reason about how how contracts uh, you know interact, and we'll talk about some of those details. In production, there are some of these optimizations that are built into the protocol. So gas fees, hundred to ten thousand times cheaper than Ethereum. Very very low gas fees. Um, contract accounts earn thirty percent of fees, um, and uh, the uh, network will automatically redistribute accounts across shards uh, to make sure that, that uh, things are, are balanced and, and moving quickly and responsibly. Even though mainnet today has only one shard, uh, before the end of the year, the plan is, I think, to have several of those. And then, of course, one second block time, three second finality. So if you're not quite sure what all of this means, that's okay. Feel free to ask a question. What does this mean? What does that mean in the questions list? Uh, but uh, I'm just going to keep moving on. And of course, you can watch the recording um, anytime after this. We'll publish it within 24 hours of this meeting. Uh, we'll clean it up and, and publish it online so that you can and watch the recording. All right, any questions at this point? Just a reminder to ask your questions. Let's dive into decentralized applications at a very high level. So you've got your application and you've got this blockchain, near protocol blockchain over here. What are you gonna do? So near exposes this API called RPC this remote procedure call, it's RPC uh, that sends and receives JSON over HTTP. It's a little bit of text, you send it over the wire, just like a website, but it's you're using an API. So JSON uh, RPC over HTTP, that's what that API is. Uh, it's not REST API, uh, because REST has, follows a bunch of conventions, you know, that, that match, um, you know, CRUD operations in a relational database typically, but um, the, uh, the RPC API is instructions that you send, maybe send a transaction, get the status of a transaction, things like that. And then around that RPC interface, we give you near API JS, which is a JavaScript wrapper that lets you communicate with near from JavaScript. And your application uses that near API JS. In fact, all of our applications also do this. The examples you find at near.dev, near explorer, near wallet, near CLI, all the tools that we're gonna be seeing and using all use exactly the same uh, infrastructure here. And, and the key there to understand is that you know we're, we're dependent on the same technology that you are. You could say we eat our own dog food. And so in that sense, we want to make sure that it's as useful and friendly as possible uh, because we're also dependent on it. And of course, stable uh, because all of these things are shared by the entire community, including us. All right. Any questions about that? Just a reminder, please add your questions. And I'm not going to spend so much time on this slide from now on. It's just a reminder. Ask questions, vote on ones that are already there. Let's dive a little bit deeper now, maybe go low level. Hold on to your seat because this is going to be a pretty intense tour. So you've got your application and you're wondering, what are you going to build? You're not really sure. You're thinking about it. And then all of a sudden you have an idea and you say, OK, I know exactly what I'm going to build. And so you write some contracts for it. That's what we're learning this week, how to write contracts in AssemblyScript and Rust using these software development kits near SDK AS for AssemblyScript, near SDK RS for Rust. You've got near protocol over here. And so you create an account on your protocol and then you deploy your contract to your account. So with Ethereum, if you're familiar with it, the account gets created for you automatically. Not so with Near, you have to create the account and you deploy a contract to it. Any account can have a contract on it, including yours. Near protocol is actually two things you can think of it, this blockchain layer and a runtime layer. So from your application, we said already, you're gonna use Near API JS now that you're writing it. And you're gonna send some request to the RPC interface to use your application. 
The blockchain layer is going to catch that request and it's going to give it to the runtime layer where a virtual machine turns on, a computer turns on, looks at the storage on the chain and loads your code. Now your code is inside the virtual machine and it's running. It might read and write your contract code, might read and write to the blockchain. And then the virtual machine responds. You've only got 200 tera gas, which is about 200 milliseconds to do work in your contract. And the response goes back to your application. So this is what the lower level, not very low, but a lower level than before of your application looks like and how it interacts with Near. You have your contracts, you deploy them to an account, and then from your application, you use Near API JS, or you could talk directly to the RPC API to communicate with the blockchain layer that has the runtime layer, turn on a computer, load your code, read and write data storage, and then give you a response and shut down. Every time you call a function in your contract, that's what happens. And you've got 200 milliseconds, 200 teragas. Any questions? Just a reminder, on your own time, please ask. Let's talk about storage a little bit more. And don't forget, you can watch this video anytime. So what's inside storage? You can actually type using near CLI, near state account name, whatever your account name is. And you'll find this metadata here. You know, things like the amount that's in your, your contract formatted. This account has 42 near or unformatted in Yocto near 10 to the 24. You'll also see a code hash, which is like a fingerprint for the contract binary actually. So every contract after you compile it has this unique fingerprint. And two accounts that have the same contract have exactly the same code hash, exactly the same fingerprint. And then of course, how much storage is used because you have to pay for that storage in something called storage staking, where we lock up your tokens um, at the price of 10 near per megabyte of data. The data is actually key value pairs. Uh, this data happens to be base64 encoded, but you can see uh, it, there's three key value pairs in the data storage. And we give you some abstractions on top of that. So actually the contract code lives in this one special key called state. For Rust and assembly script contracts, there's a singleton pattern where you have the contract code sitting in a key called state. And the other things that you wanna store are just key value pairs. Some of them, if you see towards the bottom, persistent vector and the persistent set, those are wrappers around the key value pair that give you the feeling of a vector or the feeling of a set and, and the, you know, the, the related kind of behaviors. Let's talk about testing because we're gonna be doing that this week. With assembly script and Rust, what are you doing? You're writing your contract in assembly script using near SDK AS, or you're writing your contract in Rust using near SDK RS. And then to write tests, unit tests against the contract, you have two different technologies. For assembly script, you use something called aspect. And for Rust, you use something that's baked into the language where you use this kind of macro directive pound, you know, test in between brackets. And you'll see examples of this as you look at the code. You can then build your contract into a WASM file and then simulate it using simulation testing. You can do that kind of one shot simulation testing with near VM in the, the near CLI where you just call like a method. But if you wanna orchestrate several contracts or call several methods and, and have cross contract calls, you need to use the near SDK sim, the simulator. And again, you'll see that this week where you're actually simulating the behavior of the contract as if it were on chain, but before you deploy it. And then finally you deploy maybe to test net or local net. You'll do both of those this week where you actually deploy the contract and then you can do some integration testing, maybe with near API JS or with near CLI, both of those you'll see this week as well. So those are the three kinds of testing. Unit testing, integration testing, sorry, simulation testing and integration testing in that order. Let's talk about accounts. So the account model in Near, we use 
Human readable names like alice.testnet or app.alice.testnet. And as far as I know, there's no limit to how many of those sub accounts you can have. We can read about it in the specification if you like. And so here's an example of this, you know, pay with .near or pay by .near or whatever. These are just some random accounts that I took from mainnet. And we also had this idea of an implicit account where this is an account that doesn't cost you any storage. And it's basically been created to reserve a name in order to get that name, you have to send some tokens to this implicit account. So it's a little bit of extra detail. Uh, these are close to the way uh, Ethereum account names are made. Uh, but um, again, the actual account name is gonna be human readable. So this is like a temporary account name, this implicit account. <coughs> you pay for data using storage staking. So when you have some account, this is a screenshot from the wallet, there is some minimum amount of near balance that you have to keep depending on how much data your account is holding. So this account has 20 near cents that is holding it, you know, Sharif.near, because there's uh, something like uh, 20 kilobytes worth of data. So it's one near per 100 kilobytes, 10 near per megabyte of data. This account has 20 kilobytes on it, and so it's holding 20 cents. And that, I can't spend that. I can clear out the data, uh, the contract if there is one, data on the account, keys, those all take up space and cost storage staking money. I can clear those things out and then that storage staking amount will be reduced if I want to, removing a contract or deleting some of the data. There's an unlimited number of access keys function call and full access keys. And you can see here from this account, uh, there's uh, full access and function call, two different kinds of keys that we have here. This account has two of each. Uh, there's an unlimited number of these keys. This is, this is the keys that you use uh, when you sign a transaction to prove that you have control of the account, to prove that it's you. And so with full access keys, you can see that there's nothing but the public key and then the permission and nonce. How many times have you used it? Number used once is what nonce stands for. For the function call key, we also have a budget, this allowance. So you can't spend any more than that. There's a receiver ID. Who can you call with this? So this function call access key here that the yellow arrow is pointing at uh, has a receiver ID of banana swap. And that means uh, I have, if I have the private key to this, I can spend my money up to 25 cents. That's what that is. Calling functions on banana swap dot near. If I give you the private key, you can spend 25 cents of my money calling functions on banana swap near as well. So that's how these function call access keys work with the allowance, there's some limit, the receiver ID, and then method names. If it's an empty array, then there's no constraint. Otherwise you put in the names of the functions that can be called by this function call access key. And so if we think about what can you do with near actually, you can work with identity, money, and code. The function call access key lets you use this one action, function call action, while the full access key lets you do everything create account, delete account, add key, delete key, transfer, stake, deploy contract, and function call. So again, function call access key lets you do this, full access key lets you do all of that. That's the difference. And um, contracts live on one and only one shard. They actually call each other using cross contract calls. Here's a little bit of code that we'll look at this week in an application that we built for you. And you can see here, there's a method called payout. And in this method, um, I have this contract promise batch uh, that transfers money to a winner. And then promise.then calls itself back to say the payout is complete. So transfer some money and then let me know that the payout's complete. That's cross contract calls. And that's effectively how near scales across shards. Every account is assumed to live on its own shard. Even one account, if it makes a call to itself, will go through the same machinery that it would as if it was calling some other account somewhere else across shards. And that's how you get the scalability. Let's talk about languages briefly. Assembly script and Rust contracts. Pros here for assembly script. It's easier for prototyping and trivial for you to learn if you're familiar with JavaScript or TypeScript. The binaries are smaller actually, and they're easier to read in WebAssembly as text format. So that might be a really interesting thing for you to do. Let me compile this contract in assembly script, a simple one, and then read the WebAssembly as text to see what happens. In Rust, the pro is that you've got this 
mature compiler. It's, it's been through the ringer. It's, it's the best tool chain actually in the industry to go from a programming language to WebAssembly. Uh, Rust to WASM is, is the most mature pipeline for that. Um, and and that's, um, uh, that's not surprising because of Mozilla's commitment to this technology. And so um, there is a thriving ecosystem. There's lots of real world use cases. And of course, near SDK RS, just like near SDK AS makes life easy for you. There are some cons here though. Um, on AssemblyScript, the, the compiler is a little bit immature. The ecosystem is a little immature. Debugging tools are a little bit immature. On Rust, it's a very steep learning curve. It might take you weeks or months to, to get to the point with being literate, writing a Rust contract from a blank page. And even experts, you can see sometimes, they'll fight with the compiler, kind of struggling to get the right syntax because the compiler doesn't like something. Something about how a, a, a some variables declared or who has ownership of it or, or who borrowed it last. And so that can be a little bit of a challenge with Rust. If you already know Rust, good for you. But if you, if you don't know it yet, I would recommend against trying to learn it this week. Focus on assembly script, much easier to learn. And the concepts are the same. You're still learning about near. You're not giving anything up. So here's what they look like. Contract data on the left and right, assembly script and Rust. You can see this idea of a posted message. In assembly script, it's a class. In Rust, it's a struct. And again, this is recorded and you have access to the slides. So if you feel like you're missing some of this or if it's going too quickly for you, remember you can always come back to it. Here is contract behavior, assembly script and Rust. Couple of methods in both. Export function, add message, export function, get messages in assembly script. And in Rust here, uh, uh, public function, add message and public function, get messages. We, we also need the struct in Rust because of the type system. No matter what though, the output is always a WASM file. And this is what it looks like actually, this web assembly is text. You can see their get message, add message. This is from the assembly script compilation because the Rust one is a little bit harder to read. And you can see here the add message method. If you compare this code to the assembly script code, you, you'll recognize exactly what's happening as we push and, and, and put, pull things, push and pop things off of the stack. 